You know, some are. I think with every class, especially ethnic studies classes, you have a handful of people who 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 love the class, and you have a handful of people who are just taking it for a credit, and right. and majority are just kind of lukewarm about it. <laughs> Most uh, Filipino immigrant parents don't even know these classes exist. Will probably say, "Oh, this is just a waste of time." Like, what are you learning? Like, shouldn't you just be like a doctor or lawyer or nurse or something, right? Um, and they're learning stuff that they didn't know they didn't know about because it's not in the educational system here or in the Philippines. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Here in LA, Northridge edition. Today, we talk with Joe Bernardo. Joe is a fellow podcaster, a professor, a father, and someone who's experienced the Northridge quake as a teen. He's listened to a bunch of our episodes, reached out to me, and asked if he could be part of this and talk about his beloved valley. And I said, heck yes. We also discussed Filipino life in L.A., taking the bus from LMU to Northridge, and what dudes like me should order at local Filipino restaurants like my nearby L.A. Rose Cafe. So let's get to it with Joe. Hey, everybody. I am here with Joseph Bernardo. 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 <laughs> of Northridge. Yes. Hey. hey. Thanks for having me, Tony. You're very welcome. Or as in your podcast, you'd be like, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> <laughs> you are uh, one of the, I, you have three hosts over on your podcast. Four total. Four. Yeah. yeah. Uh, called uh, This Filipino American Life. Yes. And it's just a, a very warm, engaging, fun. It, it feels like you guys are in a round table and you're all friends. Yeah, is that how it is? Pretty much, we're in a square table, and we're all friends. (laughs) So, (laughs) Uh, which is tricky because my belief is the Filipino people are the nicest people in the world. Uh, Would you you. agree with that? Uh, Some are nice, some aren't. (laughs) Who's not nice? (laughs) There's a lot of folks. Well, um, Amelda Marcos and maybe Manny Pacquiao. (laughs) But other than those two, who there there are actually some in L.A. Are there mean Filipinos? Oh, yeah, for sure. There were Filipino gangs back in the day. Were they? Yeah. 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 I, I grew up with, I didn't grow up in the gang, but I grew up like around that old, whole aura of Filipino gangs. Were, the, were these gangs in the Valley or were they on this side? They were actually all over. I mean, they started, um, the oldest Filipino gang started here in LA in 72. Uh, they were called Satanas or STS. Really? Yeah, yeah. And they started right there, historic Filipino town. Huh. They started as a car club. I, that, that's how the right. of, the official narrative is. They started as a car car club mm-hmm. and then apparently they were getting harassed by like Latino gangs and so they wanted to band together and they form a gang for self defense and mm-hmm. then they kinda grew uh into one of the largest and oldest Filipino gangs here in Southern California. Never knew. Yeah. Look, look at this. Minutes into this podcast, I'm learning stuff. <laughs> this is why I do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do Filipinos feel about historic Filipino town? Is is that is that a good thing? Is it just a token? How do you guys feel about it? You know, there are people, um, people who love it and who advocate for it. Um, and then there's a lot of Filipinos who are like, why is that Filipino town? Why does that represent the Filipino community? Mm-hmm. Right? And... Um, you know, people go there and they wonder, why is this historic Filipino town? And, and why do they question that area? Well, the, historically, um, you know, Filipinos first came here in the 1920s, right? And they settled around, they settled around the little Tokyo area, right adjacent to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they moved to like the Temple Figueroa area where the DWP headquarters is, mm-hmm. right? And then by the 50s, a lot of them started, um, a lot of Filipinos who were mainly men, after the after the war, they started uh, buying houses, and they started buying houses in historic Filipino town. Ah. So that's kind of like the historical lineage of why that place is called historic Filipino town. And it became like a uh, when there was more Filipino immigration in the '60s, a lot of Filipinos moved to that area, and then eventually moved to like different parts of Southern California. Yeah. Um, if folks don't know that history, folks would go there, and they'll be like, "Why is this?" Historic Filipino town. You go around and not uh, most of the signs, uh, most of the stores aren't Filipino. Yeah, there's there's a lot of pockets here and there, mm-hmm. um, and there's still a high concentration of Filipinos. But 
um, visibly or kind of uh, at first glance, you won't know that this is a Filipino area until right. you go there. What's the biggest pocket today? Um, so there's six major pockets, oh, I would say. In, okay. In uh, Southern California, there is historic Filipino town slash kind of Koreatown area mm -hmm. um, slash East Hollywood here as well. Yeah, it, it, we've got the L.A. Rose Cafe right yeah. around the corner. LA, you have Fernando de Manila uh, tailoring. I, you, yeah, Fernando right has patched many of my uh, jeans. Yeah, yeah. You could buy a, a nice barong there, which is a Filipino traditional wear. I have seen that. Yeah. Should I be buying one of these? They're kind of expensive. There. He's got a bunch of them. <laughs> They're kind of pricey, but, you know, I think for, for L.A., uh, that's one of the few places you actually get it there. Or really? you could get it here. Yeah. Right there? Yeah. I'm shocked. Yeah. Yeah, and there, I mean, there's other places like there's other uh, pockets, um, West Covina, Walnut area, right? Eagle Rock, Glendale. Wait a second, West Covina is that why the Jolly B uh, Tower exists? Yeah, the headquarters is there. I never knew. Jolly B headquarters in the United States is in West Covina, California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're when you're what is that? The ten freeway. Yeah. When you're you're driving down the ten, I mean that's a big building that they've got their name on. Yeah, it's pretty huge, um, and. I was surprised it's in West Covina, but I don't know. I don't, it's actually surprising to me why it's in West Covina. Maybe they caught a deal. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I think they're a major distributor, uh, or like their their distributing location is probably somewhere near there, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of Filipino like supermarkets, their distributing companies actually based in like around that area, Pomona, West Covina, that area. Mm -hmm. um, so I that's probably my guess as to why it's there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Eagle Rock, Glendale is a big pocket. Yep. Panorama City is a big pocket. Uh, I would say Carson and Long Beach um, is a pretty he like heavily populated uh, Filipino area. Mm. And I'd say that's probably the biggest one. But right. again, uh, there's like major, major concentrations. Oh, I, I, should, I should include Cerritos in that area. Okay. Yeah. There are a lot of major concentrations, but... None of them exceed maybe like 30% of the population of that right. city or neighborhood, right? And so Filipino Americans, um, it, they're a little different than like Asian American, different other Asian American communities. And we have a whole colon, uh, history of colonization, history of American colonization. So when Filipinos come here, they speak English, right? Your, and, and your version of colonization is, in a way, you're the victims of it. You've been colonized yeah. by you you'll never be called a, a colonizer, right? <laughs> Man, I mean, there's like cer certain contexts where you could be, right? Um, but yeah, for the for the most part, Filipinos have been colonized by the United States, and not a lot of people know that. You know, mm. we were a colony of the United States formally for 50 years, um, and they had a heavy impact on our population. And then you fought us, won a war, and it, no, that's what happened. Uh, well, we <laughs> lost the war against the United States. <laughs> Which, um, which basically in 1898, Filipinos were fighting for independence against Spain. Mm -hmm. America comes and initially kind of, quote unquote, helps us against the Spanish, uh -huh. but then turns around and wants to colonize the Philippines. Right? And then they fall a bloody war, uh, which estimates about 200,000 Filipinos died. No. Yeah. yeah. How, how many people are in the Philippines right now? <sighs> I want to say like 70 to 80 million Okay. All right. So that's but back then, back then it was only probably like ten million. Oh, really? Yeah. So two hundred thousand out of ten million. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And yet, it doesn't feel like you guys resent America. <laughs> I uh, would well, resent them. Well, yeah. There isn't like this. Th there are certain um, activists who are against America, American imperialism, the history of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you have to understand the history of the educational system in the Philippines. Okay. It was very pro-American, right? Especially when it was established there. Um, we all spoke English. It was the medium of instruction, yep. right? Uh, you have a huge kind of consumer market of American media in the Philippines, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then you have the history of America allying with the, well, not allying, but basically uh, fighting the war against Japan when Japan uh, invaded the Philippines. So Filipinos and Americans actually fought side by side. So we made up for it. Kind of. I think it was more about uh, historical amnesia. <laughs> really? To, yeah, I think so. I think so. a lot of Filipinos don't know the, that history. 
right? Huh. Yeah, and so, yeah, well, even let's not people tell them now, yeah, <laughs> even people who fought in World War II forgot about like that history that happened fifty years earlier, where you know Philippines were actually fighting the United States, right? And so, well, it, and it seems like America, certain parts of America, are forgetting that Russia's our our enemy. Yeah, and um, so it's fickle. <laughs> these uh this amnesia is is worldwide yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um yeah yeah and then the philippines uh, they were colonized along with you know puerto rico cuba guam right so puerto rico's is still like a colony of the united states yeah right so you have that whole history and a lot of folks don't know about it mm -hmm. um but then when filipinos started immigrating here you know uh, like i mentioned before we spoke English, so a lot of folks started to kind of blend in, right? It was easier for Filipinos to kind of blend in and not be, quote-unquote, visible like other Asian-American immigrants. And, and maybe that's why you were able to spread out a lot easier. Yeah, exactly. Because if, if Grandpa really doesn't know any English, then you kind of have to be around him. Yeah. And maybe he, you have to work for him or he has to work for you. Yeah. And so your community has this stay physically um, among each other exactly exactly but if you can speak english and you can get a job in santa monica you're going to santa monica right exactly exactly so you have a lot of asian immigrant communities where you know they don't speak english and they have to kind of concentrate in certain areas they can only go into small businesses for example for themselves for their own community mm -hmm. right uh, and that creates these kind of ethnic enclaves right i'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that filipinos in the philippines wanted to speak English because you have your own language mm -hmm. and it seems like you're very comfortable speaking that language. Um, yet, unlike Americans, you choose to be bilingual, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Again, you know, the medium instruction was, uh, was English and it was created by the Americans when they came to the United States, or when they came to the Philippines. Yeah. And it's pretty much still there. Right. And mm -hmm. you have you also have many languages in the Philippines. Right. You have Tagalog, Ilocano, Visayan. Oh, Kapopangan. there's more than just oh, Tagalog. Yeah. There's like there's like close to 200 other languages. Really? Right. And so and for folks who want to speak to each other from different regions, the medium, the kind of lingua franca, the, the, the language where people can converse with each other, it's English. So if you go to a Philippine government and you, you, you sit in, you watch them legislate. All in English. Who's speaking of? Who's the, the 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 main man of the Philippines right now? Right now, it's uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. It was a loaded question. <laughs> His parents were very bad to the Philippines. Yes, and yet he wins this election. That what was it last year? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, last May he won yeah, the election. Yeah, he wins this election, and while he was running, um, many Filipinos were nervous that. He would pardon his family for the terrible crimes that they've committed. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically stealing all this money from this this lovely place, mm -hmm. and yet he still won. Why do you think he won over there? I'm asking you, yeah, in part because you were involved in LA politics for a yeah. long time. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody could answer about politics, maybe you're not an expert of Philippine politics. So I'm putting you on the spot. But what's your guess? Why why would he be given a pass? You know, speak. Speaking with other like Filipino historians, Filipino journalists, uh, and then uh, you know just following politics, especially during election year, it was pretty much. Uh, I say it's twofold. One is there was a long period between 1986 when Marcos was ousted, and between and whatever uh, 2022 when he was elected, mm -hmm. they had decades of rewriting the historical narrative yeah. of the Marcos family. Right, um, they had decades in forming forming new alliances, right, with uh, different political families in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, one being kind of the former president Duterte, right, um, and so that they had decades to kind of rewrite the history and to really play on that historical amnesia, where a lot of Filipinos, especially of the kind of uh, working classes, lower classes, uh, to um, basically forget, uh, forget about that history, even to, uh, 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 glorify a kind of mythical past. Really? Yeah. All right. If you, and then you also have social media, 
right? You talk about fake news. Mm-hmm. Philippines was a litmus test for fake news, right? So that's how that's one of the reasons why Duterte was uh, uh, was uh, elected. Uh, that's why Marcos was elected, Marcos Jr. All right, so you have this whole uh, industry of uh, social media which creates these fake news, and you also have decades of uh, the status quo, right? You have decades of Yes, we ousted Marcos in 86, but we're, what really has changed for the working classes of the Philippines? And this last guy was was pretty much a tyrant. Yeah. Yeah. He, he would go out looking for people who were drug addicted yeah. so that he could kill them? Yes. Yes. And I forgot the intense. numbers now. Yeah, I forgot the numbers now. They had the uh, the war on crime, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, war on drugs, I'm sorry. Uh, so they had war on drugs, and uh, they killed people who uh, were drug dealers or kind of low uh, pe- low drug peddlers, mm-hmm. right? Uh, people who are considered drug users. Most of those are poor, lower classes of the Philippines, right? Mm-hmm. And especially in Manila. And then didn't it really, quote unquote, affect kind of middle class or rich Filipinos. So like they were, it was kind of, uh, they were oblivious to a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is kind of the reality of the Philippines. And so maybe compared sad. to that guy, this name that we re- recognize um, might seem safe for choice because at least we know this guy. And oh, you talk about Marcos Jr. Yeah, yeah. And but I still can't, I still can't believe that the image of his mom's shoe collection is something that could be turned into something good. Yeah, but you also have to understand the, the demographics now of the Philippines. Most of the voting age were was a lot younger, mm-hmm. right? So they don't remember that era. They don't remember because for me, I'm I guess a, a zenial. I remember when I was a kid, that's all we heard about was Amelda's shoe collection, even here in the United States, yeah. right? Uh, people always talk to me about like, what's up with Amelda's shoes? Which right? would be okay <laughs> if the country wasn't poor. Yeah. You know, like... If, if Nancy Reagan had a huge shoe collection, okay, fine, whatever. If the Saudi <laughs> queen had one, whatever, who cares? Yeah. But when, I mean, because we hear about, um, you know, the class, it's almost a class structure over there where yeah. if you're, if you're, I want to say a regular college educated uh, Filipino yeah. and you go to work, you might have a driver. Yeah. That's not out of, out of the ordinary. Yeah. And that person's getting paid like a dollar an hour, maybe less. Mm-hmm. And you have people who work for you, like, but you're just a regular person. Yeah. And but and, and that that kind of disparity um, is is not unique only to the Philippines, but having a the wife of the leader kind of rub that in the face of the of the whole world and the people just seems like it would be a non-starter anywhere else that their kid would be allowed to. I mean, you would think. But again, I think the Marcoses, they played a lot to the working classes of the Philippines, right? So they would always say, you got to blame the rich people. You know, blame the rich people. Blame the middle classes. They're the ones who are keeping you down. We're, ones, we're the ones helping you, right? It's a lot like, you know, it's, it's a lot like Trump, mm-hmm. right? Trump playing to the, the white working class. If it's they the com- same thing. If they come after me... Today, they're coming after you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And so uh, they played that politics and they played it for for decades, right? And they rewrote the history and they also teamed up with Duterte, right, to basically become a very popular candidate and he won by a landslide. Mm-hmm. And there's also corruption too, like, you know, paying people to vote for him. Sure. So that was all part of it too. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a sad situation, unfortunately. Let's switch over to L.A. politics. Sure. You worked for our former mayor. Yes. Not only while he was mayor, but even before that, when he was city council president. Yeah. I worked for him when I was, uh, sorry, when when he was council member. Oh, council member. Of the 13th district. Which is here. Yes. 13th (laughs) district. I worked for him for four years. Uh, How'd you get the job? I had a friend who worked for him before. 
uh, he said he was leaving for graduate school. Mm -hmm. And there was an opening, and I applied, and I got it. What was the job? I was a field deputy for Historic, Fil or for Historic Filipino Town, for Silver Lake, and then for Elysian Valley. So if people had gripes, they'd call the number, it would somehow get routed to you, yep. and you'd call them back, and you'd fix the problem. Try to fix the problem, yeah. It was hard sometimes. Some of those problems, like, I couldn't fix, like right? Like what? Like fireworks? Uh, yeah, like fireworks, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, f like repaving a street because there's only so much money that could go around and so many streets you can repave. Yeah. You couldn't repave every street and you can't handle every complaint. You can't fix every complaint. Yeah. That's out there. So, for example, our, our new guy is Hugo. Yeah. Um, and it, by the way, we are recording this in uh, the here in LA headquarters, which is um, very close to the Kaiser Hospital on Sunset. Where I was born. Were you really? Yeah, I was born up the street. So you've got warm feelings for this neighborhood. Oh, I love it. So, okay, let's say you were being born right now. <laughs> and your grandparents, let's pretend this wasn't Good Friday. Let's pretend it's a regular work day. And your grandparents parked at the meters. Okay. On Sunset. Every day at 4 o'clock, tow trucks come and tow away all these people in front of that hospital. Mm. So I've been tweeting at Hugo saying, if you look at sunset between 4 and 6, there's not a lot of traffic there. Maybe on paper, it makes sense to free up two more lanes because rush hour. Yeah. And maybe there was a time when sunset was busier than it has been over the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed is... Nobody cares about those lanes. And if you had people parking there, it'd be fine. Also, what is the nature of the people who are parking there? These are people visiting their either sick relatives mm -hmm. or mamas having babies or whatever it is. Like th th these should be the last people who you should be towing right now. Yeah. And I go, Hugo, can you just please look at this and for just two blocks, allow people to use the meters um, all day over there. He would he won't write me back hmm. and maybe it's because I'm me and I'm critical sometimes, but I also feel like this podcast is, is hopefully a reflection of the love that I have for LA. And what I'm trying to do is, can you imagine you're going to the hospital for grandma and you come out and your car is gone Yeah, and there's no traffic on sunset. <laughs> it seems to me that politicians have, especially today, have such a hard time becoming loved. It's so easy to hate everybody. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, a, ma a mayor of a major city right now who has an approval rating over 50%. Yeah. This is a way to do it. <laughs> Figure out ways that the government is screwing over the people unnecessarily yeah. and fix it. So if I had called your office back in 13, or uh, uh, back, in, back when you did it, if I just called yeah. the the 13 office then maybe you would have been the guy that picks up um if it was in my neighborhood yes right right uh for one thing i think garcetti had a policy where if you couldn't solve a problem you have to give a great explanation as to why i like that right so that was his policy you had to return calls you had Good. to return emails um which kept us very busy mm. but um uh, it's a great policy to have and, and, then, and, and maybe that led to him being a beloved city council president. Sure, yeah. Because yeah, he yeah. took ownership of stuff. And um, and, and so the reason I, I want to bring up Garcetti is I think he's an interesting politician. Mm. Because when he was a city council member and then president, he was really liked. And I don't think he had many people who were more popular than him in City Hall. Um, and then he became mayor and it changed. Do you have a theory why his popularity went down? I would say that anybody who becomes the mayor of Los Angeles immediately becomes unpopular, right? If you look at the history of the LA mayor, nobody has gone on to a higher office, hmm. right? Not Bradley. He lost the government. He lost the governor race like twice, Yep. right? Not Reardon, not Viragosa. Mm -hmm. Not Han, right? And so there's something about LA City Mayor that once you embody that position, 
uh, there's a lot of unsolvable problems. So it's a thankless job. It is. It's a thankless job where you're probably not going to win the hearts and souls of people. Yes. But I would also add that uh, I think when Garcetti became mayor, his first term, I think, was popular. Like his his second election, second term election, he won by a landslide. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was only like five percent of the population that voted. Right. right? Um, But I should also add the second I think the, the, the second term, there was a lot of tumultuous times. Right. Black Lives Matter right. was huge, right? And that, that was across the country. Yep. That was a trend across the country. And local mayors were the, the kind of, um, they were, a lot of them were the targets because that's where the police department lies. Which, again, if, if, if you see the populace is against the cops that much that there's protests in every state of the union. Mm-hmm. And you want to be a politician that's liked. Yeah. Reform the cops. Or at least look like you're reforming the cops. Yeah. Now, he did take a little tiny bit of money away from the cops for a short period of time, but he gave it right back fast. Yeah. Right? But, yeah. But I also think, like, throughout his career, he was very much um, pro-police. Absolutely. Yeah. He was very much pro-police. Which is politically bad when the when the... When this happened, yeah. When the city doesn't like the police. Yeah, yeah. And, and especially with social media where you can see every single time the cops do something wrong. Yeah. It's, if, if the TV station doesn't want to run it, Twitter sure will. Yeah. And so do, you, so do you think it's political suicide to go against the police as a mayor of a big city? Because I haven't seen any, any mayor, even Bass is, you know, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the most recent thing. But uh, Knock LA asked for pictures and oh, names yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. of all the cops. All the cops. Public information. And the cops gave it to them, yeah. including the so-called undercover cops. And now they're suing them. <laughs> and now they're suing them, but which is, which is normal. But the mayor is on the side of the cops. Yeah. Saying, this is, this is wrong. This is terrible. And it's like, read the room, baby. <laughs> Your own city fucked up yeah. by doing the, by by handing over public information. If you consider that a fuck up, yeah, I don't. Um, and so you're blaming people who who want the information. Yeah. Also, they're not undercover; they're plain clothes. And I don't think that you're any more in danger if somebody knows that your name is John Smith, that you're a cop who doesn't wear a uniform, than one that does. Yeah. Do you do you agree with that? No, I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, the police has, they have profiles of suspected gang members, right? Their whole gang database. Yeah. Right? Uh, and, and folks just want, hey, who are the cops? Who are the cops? Who are the cops? Who are the plainclothes cops? That's it. It's especially if you knock on my door. And, I, and especially if you're in plain clothes. Yeah. How do I know you're a cop? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. No, these are scary times. It is. It is. And I think... Going back to your other question about uh, why can't politicians just go against cops? Yeah. Those folks don't win. Some they do. Don't. Some do. But like, in the, you know, I, I think. Well, I'll, I'll bring up. Uh, sure. Again, I'm wearing the Cubs hat. So <clears throat> the new mayor of Chicago the, is so liberal, according to the police of Chicago, yeah. that they threatened that a thousand Chicago cops would quit if this guy won. And, and it seemed to help his political career. The, the people of Chicago were like, we would like a thousand cops to quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the guy won. Yeah. So it seems to me, though, that, that a lot of these people are thinking old school, which was you need the police union, you need the teachers union, you need these big chunks of groups to anoint you mm-hmm. in order for you to have political success. Ignoring the normal people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I feel like maybe that's where Karen Bass is coming from, you know. She's she's in her sixties, yeah, and she's so older, yeah. so she grew up with that kind of philosophy, yeah. Um, but I feel like it's kind of funny. Like a lot of her answers are always about, um, you know, there's some neighborhoods that want a lot of cops, want more police presence, and there's a lot of neighbors that don't. So you basically want to, you want like basically gated communities, right? right. You want uh, uh, you want Rich, you want the police to protect all the rich neighborhoods, 
I mean, it, it, it sounds like a, it sounds very odd to me. It like does, that kind of answer. It, 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 and it seems like those wealthy neighborhoods want free security. Yeah. Instead of paying for private security. Um, and you know what? I, I don't have a problem with that. Mm. I'd rather those police be over there than beating up the poor. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So any more insights with working with the former mayor, mayor you want to share with us? You know, when I was with him in council, it was it was a lot. I don't say easier, but it, it was a, a lot uh, more communal, right? It had a smaller staff. You were dealing with less people. Uh, once he got into the mayor, and I started working with him, um, there was less of that kind of community within the staff, mm. right? And so uh, there's a lot of peaks. People like jockeying for position, oh. right? There's a lot of infighting, a lot of folks. Because you have a bigger staff, there's less control of, over that staff. Yeah. So, you know, he has a, or, you know, the mayor has a staff of 250, 300 people. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, um, you know, some are always kind of, uh, uh, they're, they're funded by the, home, the Department of Homeland Security. So, like, they're always kind of left over from the previous administration. There's a deep state in City Hall? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's they're funded by uh, DHS. And, yeah, they deal with, like, public safety issues mm-hmm. and stuff like that. All right. Um, so, a lot of, a lot of the uh, gang prevention, gang intervention folks are uh, in the mayor's office. Right. And, and I got to say, I've lived here since 84. There's a lot less gangs nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, a lot less gangs. But so whatever they've done is working. Do they still need to be funded so much? Um. Well, what they've done over the last few, you know, couple of decades was uh, imprison a lot of the gang mm-hmm. members, right? So you have the expansion of the the carceral state, mm-hmm. right? And so that's how you know it's not like income inequality like uh, lessened, right? Right? They just moved a lot of gang members into jails right <laughs> and and i and as an uber driver i pick up some of these people yeah. after after they've been um released mm-hmm. and every single one of them told me that they learned more about how to be a better criminal in jail hmm. than they did before they got into jail and they have a lot of connections now and um it ain't working yeah <laughs> whatever whatever the Grand scheme was, it's not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's why, like, war on drugs failed, Mm -hmm. right? And it it better ways to legalize pot. Hey, who'd have known that? Which is another (laughs) reason I think the gangs are less powerful these days. Yeah. Because that's how they made a lot of their money back in the day. Yeah, yeah, it was a whole influx of drugs into the inner cities. What was your uh, title when you worked uh, for the mayor's office? I was, what title? I was, I think, assistant director of the office of... Uh, immigrant affairs. <laughs> this is why I love Filipinos. You're like, I, I was just his bro. <laughs> what kind of affairs? Immigrant affairs. Immigrant affairs. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of what kind of uh, tradi- a typical day would you have doing that kind of thing? I was working a lot with nonprofits and trying to uh, uh, deliver immigrant related services to uh the city, the city of la it's right? like esl programs uh, a lot of citizenship progr- programs oh uh, which isn't that the hardest thing to do citizenship yeah it's hard but you know there's a lot of nonprofits who have like you know free citizenship classes you you could there's a lot of uh resources in the la public libraries for example if you go to like almost every single public library in the L- city of la there's a um, you know a new americans corner Right, where they have all this information and a lot of resources uh, on how to become an immigrant. But so, also at the time, there was a lot of uh, politics around undocumented, right? right? So, like, there was DACA. There's a lot of education uh, that needed to get out to the community about DACA. Mm-hmm. Um, at the, also the time, it was uh, undocumented, it was driver's licenses, right? Yes. So, that legislation passed in the, in the state. And so, one of our jobs was trying to, like, coordinate and host forums about like you know what to do in, in order to obtain a license if you're you know undocumented which is very controversial and um republicans around the country pointed at mm-hmm. places like la and um 
uh, what was the term that they would call a sanctuary city? Yeah. 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 Because we were giving driver's license to undocumented people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were documenting them. <laughs> were were any of these immigrants suspicious about having a driver's license and, For sure. and afraid that it would hurt them in the long run? And which was part of the education. So when we, every time we did a forum, every time we did some kind of educational um, discussion or discussion, but like uh, any kind of event, we always had to ensure people that, you know, you're not going to, your legal status won't be um, uh, uh, unleashed to like the state. Right. Mm -hmm. oh. Even, you know, they had to make sure that then uh, any kind of enforcement like the Department of Homeland Security wasn't uh, they couldn't access that information. Right. So we always had to we always had to, like, educate folks about that. That must have been a tough sell. It is. It is. Because uh, it's one arm of the government saying we're not going to tell the other arm. Trust us. And to them, especially if you've immigrated from an even more corrupt country than America. Yeah. You have trust issues. Yeah, yeah, which is why we worked a lot with, you know, um, ethnic media, trusted, quote unquote, trusted voices to make sure. Those are trusted. Yeah. Um, and so we had to work a lot with them. But again, you know, I was I was only there for about a year and a half and then I had to leave. Uh -huh. uh, I got another job. I, I started to hate politics. And oh, really? <laughs> well, once you're once you're in it. Yeah, it's it's got to be a headache. Oh, totally, totally. If you ask anybody who uh, was working for administration, like the moment they leave, there's like a huge sigh of relief. Is it really? I would say so. Yeah. Uh, and there's some like political junkies who just love it. Right? Yeah. But Diane Feinstein folks... had to be pulled out of her seat. <laughs> yeah. She loved it. Yeah. Was she like 85 now? 86? She's rich. She's old. She's done a lot of great things. Yeah. They had to pull her out. Yeah. Yeah. But those are the politicians. I'm talking about staffers, right? The people who actually who do the work. Who are making a million dollars. Yeah. And do right? the do most of the work, right? And mm -hmm. so uh, there's a lot of stress that's involved. You know, when I was working for Garcetti, I was working like 60 hours, 50, 60 hours a week. Wow. Yeah. And so it's not, it's not for the faint of heart. Okay. So let's wrap up this segment with, Regardless of which council district you're in, mm -hmm. if you want something done, what's the most effective way to um, contact the office and get it handled? Hound the field deputy that's in charge of your area. So find out who that person is. Yes. Is, is that clearly noted on the website? You know, it all depends on the council member, right? <laughs> some people are like up to date with their website. Some people aren't. Uh -huh. um, in my experience... We were always up to date uh, in Garcetti's yep. office, and yep. you know, um, the field deputy handled those jobs or yep. a caseworker. It depends also how the how the council office was structured because everyone structures theirs differently. Yeah. Um, but I would I would always suggest find out who the staffer is for who's in charge of whatever issue that you need to get done. Okay. Yeah. So call the office, ask for the field deputy. Yeah. Leave them your number; they'll call you back. They should, you know, if they're, they weren't trained well, then they wouldn't, they, you know, that's not. Uh, Do you guys look at your Twitter? Was Twitter a thing when you were working there? Mm, not, I mean, I was there 03 to 07. So yeah. Twitter was not that popular. Right. Yeah. So it was mostly emails. Okay. Um, comments on the website. <laughs> calls. Uh, what do you think about this Kevin DeLeon situation? Oh, gosh. Um. I think he needs to resign. Yeah. Um, but I don't think he will. Because he and knows he knows the rules are so lax that nobody can force him to leave right now. Well, yeah, no council can, you know, no, no, no legislation can force him out. Mm -hmm. The only way is to recall him. Mm -hmm. And from what I heard, recall efforts have been kind of disorganized or not, you know, not very strong. Yeah. And so. You know, he's just kind of waiting to see. Uh, I mean, he he, th he thinks he thinks he won't get ousted. Um, but again, I'm you know I'm not too familiar with the. Uh, it know, it feels CD, like he won't get ousted. CD14. It feels like he's he's trying to run out the clock. It's two more years on his yeah. term. Yeah. So even if there was a recall, it wouldn't be for more than a year. Yeah. It's gonna cost a bunch of money, and I think that's another reason why people don't want to do it is. That's something the Republicans do, not Democrats. <laughs> they don't mind wasting money 
to get somebody out. Well, Republicans uh, mostly have the money, right, to do that stuff. Well, well I'm saying for like Gavin Newsom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. he was he was going to be up for election anyways. Like who cares about this this recall? Yeah. And they didn't even have a candidate. Larry Elder was their candidate. Yeah. yeah. So it's like the only reason they're doing this is to own the libs, which I still have yet to see one lib has, who's been owned by the Republicans. Yeah. And um, and so I I feel like maybe there's no energy for a recall for Kevin is because Democrats are more thoughtful about this kind of thing. And they're like, well, screw it. If, if we just have to deal with him for two more years, then fine. I'm more idealistic than that. Mm. I don't like the fact that a guy who called a black baby, or compared a black baby to a handbag, should be getting any tax money from us. And what, they get like 200, 250 grand a year? Oh, uh, was it? I don't know what it is now. Is it 280? 280 now? 280? Or? I don't know. Yeah, sure. It's too much. <laughs> so either, either prove that you truly do feel badly about this, which I still don't think he's done. No. He tried to, right? He went to, um, uh, what's that, that radio station by Tavis Smiley? 1580, right? He tried to do like an apology tour, quote unquote. Yeah. Right? But. No one's taking it. You know, there are, there are protesters outside. Yep. Um, but I, I just think a recall effort is hard. Yeah. Right? Especially how it's, I mean, I'm not sure the exact details, but. You need a ton of signatures. Yeah. In that district. Yeah. And his district seems okay about it. Yeah. Uh, they're either okay about it or just kind of apathetic about it or. Right. Right. So. I mean, we don't come out to vote anyways. Yeah. So for and, this. And a lot of people don't know about local politics. Right. Yeah. So. I mean, he's just banking on that. Yeah. And it's all, about, I, I think, just about ego, right? He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to resign. Um, but I don't know. And, and it, it, city council can't do anything either, right? And that's got to change, right? They've got, they've got to write some laws, just like they did with the sheriff. The, the, the county supervisors rewrote the law that said if, I think, um, yeah. 80% of us vote the sheriff out, then he's gone. Yeah. Because he did the same thing. He was like, you can't, you can't do anything to me. So I'm going to act a fool on my Instagram lives. I'm going to shout you down anytime I can, because you can't kick me out. But I think it's a double, double edged sword because if say the city council has a, a very progressive uh, uh, candidate that nobody likes, uh, is it fair for the city council to vote that person out? It's it. Well, they're also it's tricky because if you do vote them out, or her. the city or her, <laughs> or they, they, the city, the voters may vote those people out. So yeah. like this Nashville thing that's happening right now, where they've expelled two black uh, people for yeah, yeah for protesting. Not only are those guys going to get back their chairs, but all those other Republicans may have issues themselves. Mm -hmm. Because it is, the public doesn't like to be, have their vote reversed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a yeah. dangerous move. That's probably more dangerous than saying the cops don't need $8 million a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, I could see why it should be, in, like, why some kind of policy where they they can kick out a council member should be in place, but so I could also you, see the other the, kind of the dangerous reasons why that it shouldn't be like that. So how about, how about this then? I'm glad we're brainstorming for our city that we <laughs> love. By the way, he's wearing a beautiful purple, uh, t-shirt, Lakers colors. And in, um, I really like this shirt <laughs> Thanks. in, in, uh, like a Gothic times Gothic. It says I sunshine LA. Yeah. Those are the Philippine sun. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah. It's the Philippine sun and then L.A. in the old English. So it's perfect. Yeah. So, okay. So maybe the solution is this. I'm all about solutions. I don't like to just bitch. 80% of the city council and of and a yes by the mayor. And to then, oust somebody. To oust somebody. So it's it's got to be – It's some butts have to be in the line, on the line to oust somebody. And and I think right now I don't think I think it would be unanimous in city council that vote. Does he have any allies that you know of right now? Not that I know of. I mean, some people who are less right. uh, less vocal about it, and that'd be a tricky vote. Yeah, to vote to keep KDL in there. Yeah, 
So it'll probably be unanimous. And then the mayor would go right along with it. But what if... So you have uh, a city council full of people who don't live in CD14. Yep. Right? Vote against, quote unquote, the will of the people. Well, but that was the will of the people before the incident. Oh, I'm, I'm saying hypothetically, not just like right. Kevin DeLeon. Right, right. Right. Um, but I mean, the, we voted for Villa Grossa, the sheriff. Villanueva. Villanueva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he turned into to be a terrible person. Yeah. So you vote. Yeah. So you. And then he, yeah, he, he pushed he the lost. emergency button. Yeah. And we don't want to push the emergency button. We want democracy, especially when only 5% are, are voting. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, I, I mean, I think there should be some kind of policy in place. But again, there is there's that tricky part where like uh, if it, the, the, the tables were reversed. Yeah. Right. Then you have a, a very political, politically progressive person who just conservative city council doesn't like. Mm -hmm. They can easily oust that person. I mean, well, that's the tricky part, too. See, you're proving my point about Filipinos being nice. <laughs> Look how nice you're being. You're right. But nothing's stopping him from running again in two years. Sure. So let's say he got ousted. Let's say this uh, law yeah, existed. Yeah. Yeah. He, gets to, he gets to take a little breaky-poo, regroup, fundraise. Trump is showing that when you're the villain, sometimes you make money off of that because you pretend that you're the victim. Yeah. And so you fundraise. And then you come out strong. Yeah. If it's truly will to the people, then he'll get that person. Then get he'll get back in. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I, I, I like that then. All right. Yeah. Talk about Northridge. Northridge. You were born here in Hollywood. Yes. How long have you lived in Northridge? Uh, on and off. I mean, I don't know how many years, but I moved around a lot when I was a when I was a kid. But it was always in and out of Northridge. I lived in Calabasas for a little bit. Ooh. Yeah. Um, I went to high school there. Calabasas High. Yes. Is it what I'm thinking it is? <laughs> it's a pretty well-to-do public school. Is it really? Yeah. What uh, What does Calabasas High have that Hollywood High wouldn't have? Uh, well, so Beverly has yeah. this basketball court that spreads apart and there's a pool underneath. <laughs> you guys got anything like that at Calabasas? When I was going there, probably not. You know, it was, it was open. There was no gates, no fences. Ah. You know? They had a huge kind of like tree grove that people kind of uh, uh, would hang out at, uh -huh. right? Um, but again, I was actually living in, uh, I guess I should, uh, it's okay to say this. I was living in Northridge while going to Calabasas for a time because uh, we did move, we did live in Calabasas, but then we moved back to Northridge. Yeah. But uh, uh, we, still kept, we still kept the old address so I right. can go to school there. <laughs> and you're not the only one that does this. Of course. Uh, but did your mom have to drive you to school every day? My dad. Yeah. How long of a drive was that? About half an hour. It's not too bad. That's cool. Yeah. And parents are driving their kids to schools all the time. Yeah. All yeah. over the city. Yeah. Did he pick you up from school too? No. Well, my mom picked me up. I I went to, I would, after school, I would hang out at the library. And then once that closed around like four o'clock, I went to, um, uh, one of those YMCA uh, um, little clubhouses. No, 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 it was like a one of the day camp things or after school programs yeah. where I was a kind of a junior counselor there. How about that? Yeah. Now I'm I'm a lot older than you. Sure. I used to do that a little bit too. Mm. Um, what was great about it back then was they had like lunch. Did they have food for the kids uh, at this YMCA? Uh, well, um, they probably did. Like just little snacks. Yeah, 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 snacks for sure, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, I was only there like after school, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. but they, they had milks, like little lunch yeah, yeah. milks and maybe a half a sandwich or like. They would have bagels for breakfast. I don't remember. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like it, it seems it seems to me that you need to be keep feeding the kids. Yeah. And especially if you're enticing kids to come there, feed them a little something. Yeah. Um. Well, how, how pure? You're going to the library, so you got all your homework done, probably. 
Most, uh, yeah, most of before you got home. Yeah, and then I would uh, go to the YMCA. It was it was work, but I was like more volunteering, right? And my mom would pick me up around six thirty, and then I would go straight home back to Northridge. Was it worth it? Was Calabas High better? Do you think for you than if you'd gone to Northridge High? Um, you know, I have no, nothing to compare it to. I had friends who went to Granada. Like I would have gone to Granada High, okay. right? If I stayed within the district and within my neighborhood. Yeah. But um, I mean, I would say so. Uh, but again, there were like certain there was there are a lot of issues that I dealt with in 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 Calabasas that I wouldn't have when, when I went to Granada. For example, one of the, uh, being one of the only Filipino kids. Yeah. In Calabasas, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was harassed. Yep. You know, growing up. Um, you know, they call me chink, dog eater, stuff like that. <gasps> oh, yeah, for sure. And you're like, w- we eat. Uh... <laughs> we eat everything. <laughs> <laughs> so and some folks do eat dog. But, you know, there was you know, definitely a pejorative. Um, that so, is, that, that's got to hurt, though. I, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good school. Uh, no, the chink, the chink sure. part. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. come on, there's a, there's slurs for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a thing, being Filipino, especially like in in certain certain uh, certain areas in the United States, like they don't know what Filipino is, so they assume you're Chinese, you're right. Japanese, right? So, right, I got that a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people I know grew, uh, got that a lot. Yeah. If I went to Granada, there was a huge um, Filipino population, there's a huge Asian population there. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have gotten that. Was it hard to make friends in Calabasas? I made friends with other Asian Americans. Interesting. And those who are, you know, more tolerable, I guess. Right. right? So at the lunchroom, <laughs> all the Asians were sitting together on, on one table or a yeah, lot of them? Yeah, you know, like, especially back then in the 90s, like, it, everything was more racialized. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And especially when we think about L.A. and Southern Cal yeah. and... You look at a campus like what you're describing with no fences and trees. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's perfect. Let's move here. Yeah. <laughs> but you look in the, the classroom and it's as segregated as Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Um, and self-segregated, which might be worse because yeah. the kids feel like this is the best way for us to survive in here. Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's why a lot of Asian Americans, um, at least in that school, Hung out with each other. I remember there was like a whole table for, full of the only black people who went to Calabasas. Mm-hmm. You know, we joked back then that Calabasas was Calablackless. Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> wow. You know, this is pre Kardashians, right? But still, pre Drake, like, pre, pre yeah, uh, pre Kanye. Kanye. <laughs> you know, but you know, they, they still had a reputation where, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of rich kids were there. I remember going to school there and. Uh, I was listening to a conversation between two folks, and it was an argument saying, what was the better car, a, a Lexus or a Mercedes? Oof. And I'm like, where the fuck am I? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you have, like, racism. You, have, you also have classism, for sure. Yeah. Uh, going into school like that. So, I mean, it's just, it's just different, but it was just my experience. Uh, okay, Northridge. Yes. Totally different demographic. Yeah. Very working class. Uh, it's middle. I'd say middle and working class, both. Right. Yeah. Uh, does Northridge have houses that have horses? Or do um, I have to go a little bit north for that? It's more, yeah, it's more like Chatsworth. Okay. Right. Um, you have some trails like up in Porter Ranch, but I don't see any like uh, houses with horses. Right. But uh, I think that's kind of the feed, the, uh, the Chatsworth kind of side of things. Yeah. Um, you have those ranch houses there, yeah. Well, uh, did people talk about the Northridge earthquake a lot when you were in school there? Yeah, especially uh, back then, 94. It was just, I remember it felt like God like shook my house, like took it up. And you were shook in Northridge during the quake? Yeah. How old were you? 14. Oh my goodness. Yeah, 14. Wow. Yeah, and it was funny because my, my dad was staying overnight at the hospital. I forgot, he had like a surgery or something or mm-hmm. some kind of condition and it was just me and my mom. And it was like scary, right? Um, and then I, I had friends who lived down the street. Like uh, they ended up camping out the night before in the park. And, no, in their backyard. 
Mm -hmm. Right? They're just camping out. Be because people didn't trust the structure yeah. of their houses and apartments. Yeah. So a lot of people camped out in the parks and yeah. in backyards. Backyards. I remember they're going, like, my, my cousin lived in uh, one of those kind of condo complexes where they had a pool. Everyone got water from the pool to drink and to <gasps> use yeah, or to bathe, maybe. Wow. Yeah. And then I remember going to the store. The liquor store just so because we need water and they were charging like I think eighteen dollars a Those bottle. Those dicks. <laughs> yeah. What dicks? Yeah. I mean, granted, they had they had a lot of damage, a lot of broken. Yeah, glasses but come on. Stuff. Yeah. They're just they should be part of the community. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it, it, that that was kind of surprising. At, at yeah. I remember it was I was supposed to go to a Laker game. <laughs> I was supposed to go to a Laker game and then they had to cancel it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the weird experiences. Uh, My man's wearing a Laker cap, so he d has not used. He, he, you're not holding that against them. <laughs> You've forgiven them. Yeah. Uh, did anybody you know uh, get seriously injured? No. Good. No. No. Because there was a lot of injuries and there deaths. There was. There were some deaths. Yeah. Uh, down the street was that kind of famous apartment complex. Really. Which was three stories, and after the earthquake, it was two stories. That's right. Where they had carports on the first story. Yeah. yeah. And, and they weren't strong enough. Yeah, the dingbat apartments. Mm -hmm. You have plenty here in Hollywood. So, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, at 14, you were probably going to that Northridge Mall a lot. Oh, yeah. I was, uh, and that, that got was my mall. heavy damage. Yeah, that was, it was closed for a while, I remember. And then uh, it was closed for a lot of, a uh, long time for rent renovation, and everybody. Went to other malls because <laughs> you know back then you know they had no phone, right? Right. We hang out at malls. We were mall rats. That was the spot. Yeah, Northridge was a spot right there, Space Station, where the arcade was. Look at you. <laughs> what uh, what arcades would you play? Or what arcade games would you play? Oh, back then Street Fighter Two. Nice. Yeah, Street Fighter Two. That was the thing where you put the quarters in. <laughs> you would put the quarters in line to make sure to to, to claim yep. that you're next. Yeah. You know that was uh that was my era right there. I was always Chun Li. <laughs> <laughs> so um where was the where was the the post northridge ar uh, arcade over there i mean i think space station i can't remember now but i think space station reopened uh-huh right but then but i like got, where would you go would you go to like canoga park woodland hills oh, oh, oh I, during that renovation yeah yeah we would go to uh topanga mall okay yeah we hang out there sometimes panorama city mall um, we would go to Glendale Galleria. That, that was actually a hot spot for a lot of Filipino Americans back in the day. Really? Yeah. That, how would you get there? That seems like a trek to me. Oh, we always had friends who drove. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Older friends or something older, like, yeah. Older cousins or something. Do you still go over there? Glendale? Uh, not, I mean, I'm an old suburban dad now. I don't go out much anymore. Right. <laughs> how many kids you got? Uh, I got one. Two and a half years Two old. Two and a half years old. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. She runs my life. I bet. Yeah. yeah. I bet. Okay. Let's finish up with um, your podcast. Sure. This Filip this Filipino American life mm -hmm. has has uh, NPR come after you for that name? <laughs> Are they upset? I don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> Good. No, but no. Nope. Everybody's cool with it. Everyone's cool with it. We're not big enough to like render that kind of attention. What? Uh, uh, tell me a little something about this podcast. So it started out as. Um, <laughs> I was I was a little depressed. Uh, I went to graduate school, uh, got my doctorate. In, what? Yeah. Where? University of Washington. Maybe this Calabasas High was okay. <laughs> I should say I went to Santa Barbara. You did? You're a gaucho? Yes. What? Yes. What years were you I there? I know you did, so like that's why I wanted to mention it. Yeah. Uh, I was there 97 to 01. Wow. Yeah. We may have crossed paths. Oh, you were there well, back then? Well, I graduated in, in 91. Okay. But I came back a lot. It's a fun place. Yeah. Yeah. Party in IV. Hell yes. <laughs> I was there last week. As you know, we were supposed to do this last week. Yeah. 
but a friend of mine has a, a, a child who is going to city college yeah. and living in IV. So I was glad to take that assignment to drive her up there. And then she showed me um, what's going on there now. It's changed. It has changed a lot. Yeah, a lot of big buildings. And, Do you yeah. remember the uh, the rugby fields next to the football stadium? It was just a whole... Well, it was oh, just it's all grass. housing now, isn't it? It's all housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all housing. Right there. Uh, I forgot the, that top street. But so, El Colegio, I think. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you... you Oh, you're, sorry. Yeah, podcast, right? No, no, no. You're a you're a gaucho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you went up to Washington State. No, well, I was a gaucho, and then I went to a master's program at SF State. SF for two State. Years. Yeah, San Francisco okay. State. Got my master's in what? Asian American studies. Good. And then I moved back to LA. Started working for Garcetti for four years. Uh huh. And then I applied to grad school and got to went to I moved to Seattle. Went to University of Washington. Mm hmm. Um. And then, yeah, so I graduated. And, and what was your doctorate in? History. Of? Uh, well, U.S. history, uh, but my specialty was uh, Filipino-American history. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Right on. And so I did my dissertation on historic Filipino town. You did? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, going back to the podcast, so, I, you know, I was a... Uh, so you're the perfect person for <laughs> this podcast. Yeah, so basically I, I, I was depressed because... Um, I had a PhD, but I wasn't doing anything. You know, I wasn't a professor or anything. I, I kind of swore off academia. What? <laughs> your mother and I spent so much on your education. Oh, yeah. But once you get to grad school, like, it's not like your parents pay for that. <laughs> Who pays for it? Uh, I got uh, scholarships and fellowships and stuff like that. Awesome. Like, you know, when you go, to, uh, you go to Santa Barbara, for example, you have a TA. Yeah. Right? The TA is a grad student. Okay. And that's how they pay for their graduate education is to TA. Which seems like an easy gig. I don't know about that. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's easy. Well, you got to grade all the work. papers. Yeah. You have to read all the papers. You do all it. the grunt work that the professors don't want to do. Right. <laughs> but then the pretty girls, they come in your office hours and sit on uh, your lap and I can't do whisper that. that's, in your that's, ear. That's dangerous, man. That's it's dangerous. True. You get fired. Will you? Get, especially now. Come oh, on. Crap, you're right. <laughs> All right, I won't. I guess I won't be a TA then. <laughs> you don't want to be a professor now. You've learned all this, and I mean, you're again. You're a very nice person. <laughs> you're educated. You speak well. You'd be a great professor. Well, I do teach. I where I, do you teach at? Loyola Marymount University. What? I teach a. I teach a, a one class, the Filipino American Studies class there. Uh, at the SE campus downtown. Or LMU uh, Westchester. Way. You, you, from Northridge, you go all the way over there? Yep. That's, uh, I, I worked there for seven years. I took the bus for a long time until COVID happened. And then, um, what, wh how long does that take? <laughs> uh, on a good day, hour 45, door to door. That's actually pretty fast. Yeah. Is there an express bus somewhere? There is a commuter express bus that like, takes me from Granada, Granada Hills. Yep. Uh, all the way to Sepulveda and Manchester, and then that last mile or so. Whoa! That's actually where the longest the, the time is is waiting for a, the the transfer bus to take me from like you know a couple miles to LME campus. And, and nowadays, you would just take an Uber if you wanted to. I yeah, I did take an Uber once in a while, but uh, uh, it got more expensive. I started taking those bird scooters. <laughs> yeah. So. It was a little dangerous because, like, I never wore a hel helmet. Okay, because I'm an Uber driver, I know where that Sepulveda in Manchester is. Yeah, it's uh, there's a Coles over there. Yeah, uh, my favorite sushi place is over there. It's called Camp High. It's right next to the Med Men. Oh. You're not a pot smoker. Uh, uh, that's the it's on Lincoln. The the original is on Lincoln. Oh, but number two is on Sepulveda. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. So. So the commuter bus takes that long to get from that corner. And that's a busy corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then the, the, the COVID happened. So the bird scooter makes sense because yeah. that stretch of Manchester, I mean, there's traffic, but it seems like no, it's safe. No, it's residential. It's residential. It's safe. Yeah. Sometimes I'll go, I'll cut through the neighborhoods because it's safer. Right. Right. But there might even be a bike lane. Over they there. added a bike lane. Yeah. So I would take that. Um, 
and then <laughs> drop it off sc- right in the, the gate of LMU and then you know walk to my building. <laughs> the so- bird scooter. That's actually <laughs> Okay, Alyssa Walker, who lives in historic Filipino town, shout yes. out. I hope she's listening to this. Yeah, hi, Alyssa. She, she's going to be so happy to hear that for years you took this commuter from Granada Hills to Westchester. Yeah, I, I it was great because uh, those commuter express buses, they, they're comfy. Yeah. You know, they're, comf- they're like nice coach buses. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people who commute from the valley down to like, it's like El Segundo, like uh-huh. some some parts of Playa Vista, right? Do they charge you what a regular bus would charge? They no, they charge you a little more, like three bucks or something no, each way. No, four seventy five, I think. Okay, still that's way uh, cheaper than an Uber. Yeah, yeah, four seventy five to take me that long. Four seventy five each way. Yeah. The only problem I would say is the latest bus leaves Granada Hills like at seven thirty a.m. Yes. So oh. I'm like. So my, like my commute usually started like a I would take like a six forty five bus, yeah right, um, but if I'm you know I'm late it's like the seven thirty bus and I'm like that's still kind of like that's still early like can't yeah. you add more um, add more buses couple more buses yeah um, and it's yeah and the latest bus that takes you back home I think the last bus is at six thirty this the last bus that you would take was it. What was the capacity? 50%? Before COVID, no. It was before COVID, maybe 75%. So, so there is a demand. Yeah, but you know, I, I've taken the bus post-COVID. It's pretty empty. Yeah. yeah. People are working from home now and stuff? Exactly. That's why I don't really take it anymore because I have a hybrid schedule. Right? Oh. Right? So I, could, I have a way more flexible schedule. I, work, I only have to go on campus maybe two, three times a week. Uh-huh. Uh, and... Um, I could kind of come in after traffic, so I'll just drive. So you know, I'm I'm a definitely like a public tra- transit advocate, but yeah, it's harder now, right? Mm-hmm. Post COVID, and you know, I have a kid now, so yeah. I have to take take her to daycare, and which, uh, you know, there's no buses that run after that, so I have mm-hmm. to drive. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, what do you teach at uh, LMU? So uh, my day job is I work at the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Great. Yeah, so I basically work on like DEI policies for the for the university. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but as a side gig, uh, and what really fulfills my passions is uh, I teach the Filipino American Studies class there. Hell yeah. 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 And are the kids into it? You know, some are. I think with every class, especially ethnic studies classes, um, you have a handful of people who 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 love the class. And you have a handful of people who are just taking it for a credit. And, right. And majority are just kind of lukewarm about it. Yeah. <laughs> but I would imagine a lot of your kids are Filipinos, right? Yeah. yeah. And so they're taking it because first their parents probably want them to or their grandparents probably want to. No. They want for themselves. They want to learn about their history. Yes, because most parents, most uh, Filipino immigrant parents don't even know these classes exist. Will probably say, "Oh, this is this is a waste of time." Like, what are you learning? Like, yeah. shouldn't you just be like a doctor, or a lawyer, or a nurse, or something? Yeah, right. Um, and they're surprised that LME even offers it, right? So, like, it's really the students taking initiative and wanting to learn about their history and culture or whatever, like, uh, whatever their kind of reasons are. They're the ones who really want to take the class, and mm-hmm. They're learning stuff that they didn't know they didn't know about because it's not in the educational system here, right? Or in the Philippines. So, well, that's beautiful that you're doing that. Thank you. What What's your favorite place to eat in Northridge? It depends on the food, uh, on the cuisine. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I have a lot of like local spots I love, but we'll blow you know, I would say them. I would say Brent's Brent's Deli. Brent's Deli. You've been there, right? I have not. Oh my god! I would say it's the best Jewish deli in. Should I say LA? Say it. Say it. <laughs> it's okay. I, it's one of the best Jewish delis in LA. Filipinos, nicest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I like it better than Langers. Right. I like it better than Cantor's. It, well, first of all, is it open longer than Langers? Because uh, Langers closes at like three o'clock. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Kendrick is 24 hours. No, no, it doesn't be. That's not 24 hours. Right. Nothing in Northridge is 24 hours except like a Denny's or something. But <laughs> but Cantor's, I like it, but I'm not blown away by the food. I like the atmosphere there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great late night spot. Yeah. Yeah. Brent's, the food is amazing. Okay. It's, uh. Where's it at? Right there on Parthenia and between Tampa and Corbin. Great. Yeah, it's right there. There used to be a movie theater there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where I saw Friday <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> when I was fifteen, I saw that movie. I saw that movie there. That theater is right there. But <laughs> yeah, it's you know it's a it's an institution there in Northridge. I love it. Um, my my kid loves the fries there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys do when? Because one of the only drawbacks I can think of about mm. Northridge is it can get really hot in the summer. Yeah. What do you guys do when it's really hot? <sighs> Cause not pay a lot of money for air conditioning. Oh. Yeah. How much did you pay last year, last summer? Do you remember? I don't remember. I think sometimes, some, some uh, some days are, or some months, our DWP bill will be like 700 bucks. No. Yeah. How big is this place you're living in? Three bedroom, two bath. House. Yeah, house. So regular sized house. Sure. $700 a month. No, 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 no. It's every other month, so. Every other, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It still seems like a heck of a bill to have. Yeah. I mean, that includes water and trash and all right. that stuff. But it goes high during the summers because people are blasting air conditioner. And because my wife works at home, I work hybrid, right? So, like, uh, we would have it on, you know, during the summer. Like, Do you, bef- have, a, do you have a pool? No, no. Where, where do you take the, 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 the two-and-a-half-year-old when she wants to swim? Um... There is a I go to my cousin's kind of apartment or condo complex. Good, right? Townhome complex. I yes. go there, uh, and I haven't taken her to Northridge, the Northridge Park pool, uh-huh. yet because she actually only started learning a few months ago. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. But I used to go there when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. It's a great public pool. Is it is it great to live in the the neighborhood that you grew up in? I I mean. It's the only way I can afford a house, right? Because this is this is my parents' first house, the, mm-hmm. the house that I live in now, mm-hmm. right? So I'm basically paying I'm paying my parents' subsidized rent. <laughs> or, that's fine. So then that yeah. seven hundred bucks didn't hurt as bad. No, 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 no. Right. Yeah, but yeah. it still hurt them. Sure, it hurts. It hurts for sure. Yeah. Um, and you know, if I didn't live uh, in my parents' old house, yep, then I don't know where I would live. To be honest with you, it's it, impossible to live to buy a house here. It would be. I would probably be renting somewhere, and it'll be a smaller house or a smaller apartment. So, as as Springsteen saying, bills that no honest man could pay. Yeah, and 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 I think about that all the time. Like, fine, if I went back into cocaine selling, <laughs> I could be your next door neighbor. Yeah, I could also have a three bedroom house. Yeah, but how does a regular person do it? And you've got a doctorate. <laughs> well, right? doctorates don't make money, especially they in, don't. As, Especially PhDs in history. Come on, there's not a demand for that. No, there's a, if anything, like it's impossible. To, it's a, nearly impossible to get a job. You know, uh, you're the second LMU professor on this podcast. Ah. Uh, Dr. Eric Greenberg, who okay. teaches, he's a Jew who teaches about the uh, New Testament over ah, there. Yeah, theology department. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great guy. He. Um, He's, just, he's about to publish a book about his uh, mom. Um, but he said the same thing. It was a struggle even to get that job. He had to do a bunch of part-time teaching jobs yeah. to even get there. Yeah. And once he's there, it's not like there's buckets of money. Yeah. That's why I swore off academia. And that's part of the reason, right? Because for me, I only wanted to live in L.A. Yeah. Right? Because I know people who have PhDs, they have to like go Anywhere that there's a job opening. Mm-hmm. Uh, I only wanted to teach in L.A. I only wanted to teach in the ethnic studies kind of department. And so I was and I had experience like outside of academia. So I'm like, I could get a job, like a regular job. And um, I, I wasn't dependent on an academic job to survive. But I would imagine you would love to teach at Cal State Northridge. Uh, eh. No, no. I mean, I, I, I like I like the career I have now, to be honest with you. Like I'm not. You could, you could ride a bird scooter to Northridge, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, the commute would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's something about it being at a smaller school, 
like LMU, there's a nice community. There is. Yeah, there's a nice community. It's more, uh, it's more mission centered than like, than CSUN. CSUN is just like CSUN. I think has the, the highest number of students, right? Yeah. Like anywhere in Southern California, right? Yeah. And so, you know, students are a number in those, in those kinds of institutions. Like you at LMU, change, there's a little bit more students. That. Uh, you would make them feel at home. Sure, I've, I've sure. done some guest lecturing at, at, at Northridge. Oh, nice. And um, yeah, the campus is big, but what the the class itself yeah. isn't necessarily bigger. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to swear it off or anything, but dude, it's right there. <laughs> There's also like all these kind of intangibles about academia where I, I'm not attracted to it. So huh. yeah, like I don't like writing. <laughs> <laughs> Then you, I, I get it. Yeah. So what do you want to do then? I like what I'm doing now. I work in the DEI space and trying to, mm-hmm. you know, make our university more equitable, more inclusive, right? I do like workshops about anti-racism, about yeah. uh, implicit bias, stuff like that. Um, and then I also teach on the side. So like, yeah. I'm I'm golden. And and I would think that if your parents weren't living in the house with you you might try to move to El Segundo or somewhere closer. Sure, yeah, yeah. But Northridge is where you're from. Yeah. Your parents, your friends are there. You've got all this history. Yeah. I, 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 I you know. I, so, so a little hour and a half commute <laughs> is no big deal. Especially in this time where you have a skeleton schedule, you have a more flexible schedule, right? right? Um, I would seriously consider moving if... COVID didn't happen. I had to go there every single day. Right. And I had a kid. Yeah. Right. Because my kid goes to a, a school nearby Northridge. So mm-hmm. um, my schedule just wouldn't allow like me being there every day. I would like go crazy. Is your wife Filipino too? <coughs> yes. Do you guys uh, speak uh, multi languages in the house for the child? <laughs> I try to speak the Galog mm-hmm. uh, um, to my kid. My wife grew up Ilocano, which is a different language. No. Yeah. But um, she doesn't speak it as well, right? She was. Thank God. <laughs> so it's mostly Tagalog, which I'm trying to teach my my daughter. She understands things here and there. Yeah. Uh, doesn't respond back in Tagalog, mostly English, <laughs> because I'm the only one really speaking to her. Right. Your parents so, aren't speaking that. No. What? No. So a thing about Filipino immigrants mm-hmm. is that again, because English is a medium of instruction. It's kind of a dominant language in the Philippines. When they come here, they speak English. Yeah. A lot of Filipino immigrants don't teach their kids the language. Weird. Yes. Is it a prestige thing, too, that if you speak yeah. English, then you're, yeah. the it's appearances a, yeah. you're smart? Yeah. It's a class thing for sure. Yeah. And then huh. uh, and even like, quote unquote, Filipino language schools, they don't really exist here in the United States. Oh. There's some here and there, but they're not big like Chinese language schools or Japanese right. language schools, Korean, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of second generation Filipino kids like me who grow up here, like we don't, most of us don't speak uh, Tagalog or any kind of Philippine language. Wow. But I'm an exception because when I was born, my grandmother was the one who came uh, and took care of me and she didn't speak any English. Yeah. And so um, I happened to learn it. Even though my siblings don't know it, and they're older. Yeah. Right. So I was a little lucky in that sense. On your podcast, you guys do bust with the the Tagalog. How do you how do you yeah. say that? Tagalog. Tagalog. Yeah. You guys mention that a bunch in there. <laughs> it's it's sprinkled. Yeah. It's yeah, nice. Yeah. 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 It's 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 the same as when I hear uh, dominant Latino uh, podcasts. Um, there's a Spanglish going on there. Nice. And it seems like there's a little something that going on in your podcast too some it's only the two of us who really speak the galog mm-hmm. right um maybe one understands and one doesn't so <laughs> i mean it's very minimal to be honest with you yeah yeah how long has the podcast been going on for oh so 2016 2016 we started um and then yeah we've been going strong ever since well yeah. i know now why you were depressed why is that well, the Cubs beat the Dodgers, uh, and then we got Trump <laughs> in office. Everybody should have been depressed. Yeah, well, actually, we started before Trump was elected. Not yeah, good for you, but and, and before the, the the Dodgers lost against the club, the Cubs. <laughs> um, but we, um, yeah, we started back then, and we've been going strong ever since. So seven years. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. It is. It's it's. Uh, I mean, we don't. To be honest with you, we don't put as much 
investment in it like we did uh, prior just because life happens yeah right i have kids my 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 uh another colleague um married into a family with kids mm -hmm. right uh another folk had to kind of take care of their parents so like life happens so we're not as kind of devoted to the podcast but we try to be um and you know this right i think the success of a podcast is consistency yeah right so we're lucky enough to be consistent and i think that's that's why we survive so long well for for this one the success is the guest ah, thank you everything's <laughs> on the guest uh, and you have great guests. You've had great I've, guests. I still have, and they're only getting better and better and better. Yeah. They're all great, but I don't think people are tuning in for me. And a lot of times they're not even really tuning in for the neighborhood. They will fall in love with the guest hmm. and learn about the neighborhood through that. Yeah. 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 You know? And so. Am I your first Northridge person? You are. Ah. Yeah. Nice. Which, which is shocking to me because it's such a big place. Yeah. Yeah. And. It's definitely changed. You know, think about the valleys. Uh, I remember there were some articles here and there saying how oh, it was. Um, uh, it was a Paul Thomas, Paul Thomas Anderson, right? He uh -huh. did an article about uh, when he was doing like uh, publicity for Licorice Pizza. Yeah, uh, you know, it's all about the valley and yep. whatnot. And in, in his article, he was saying, "Yeah, the valley hasn't changed very much." What? Yeah. And I'm like, PT. Well, what part of the valley are you fucking talking about, right. man? Valley, the, the valley's changed so much, right? And constantly. And I think maybe the south of the south of Ventura hasn't changed all that much, right? But definitely, uh, the places above Victory Boulevard has changed tremendously, yeah. right? What, what are some of the biggest changes you've noticed in Northridge? Demographics. There you go. All right, that's huge. How so? When my family moved there, it was a, it was the late seventies. I remember my grandmother telling me they were the only non-white household, right? And then gradually there would be more and more. And now um, there's probably only like one or two households that are white. Really? Yeah, in, in my specific neighborhood. So mostly Latino, though, right? No, it's mostly uh, there's a lot of. Uh, Asian Americans and folks from like, you know, uh, Armenia, yeah. Iran, yeah. um, there's like a bunch of, you know, people in the Phil from the Philippines, from Korea, mm -hmm. right? You have those demographics, India, right? You have like Indians in the, in, in Which kind is of the North Ridge. This is, so, okay. So when I go to the in and out in uh, Glendale, uh, okay. across from your mall, okay, it is like being in the United Nations. Hmm. There are very few white faces. Weirdly, the the white people are running the cashier. Hmm. It's like a white teenage boy. <laughs> but everybody else is all different ethnicities. You'll hear all these languages. Yeah, everybody's getting along. Yeah, it's no big deal. It's Glendale. We're having fun, and it's it's just a beautiful slice of America. Yeah, and I you're was, saying that that's what Northridge is. That's what it was growing up. To be honest, I remember my experience was hanging out with a bunch of other neighborhood kids. And we were all from different places. Yep. Another a couple Filipino guys. My my neighbor was Pakistani. One was Jewish, right? Uh, and then the Italian Italian family and a kid from uh, he's from Sacramento. He was black. Yeah. Right. And that was just how we rolled, you know. And that was that's the valley I grew up in, right? But then I would go to um, those Facebook groups like Northridge of the past or something, or, yes. or, uh, I think growing up in San Fernando Valley, right. And yeah. You have a lot of baby boomers who are very nostalgic about the valleys kind of past from the fifties and sixties. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was kind of quote unquote the heyday. Right. And they all say it's the heyday. Uh, and they, they've since moved on to like, Oh, I live in Idaho now. And <laughs> the valleys change and like, Oh, it's such a dump now. I'm like, yeah, it was the past because it was very uh, uh, homogeneous, mm -hmm. right? I see picture people pic posting pictures of their, oh, this is my Little League team, all white faces. Right. Right. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the stereotypes about the Valley. It's a very kind of um, white, white spot, right? And it was back in the day, but, mm -hmm. you know, over the last, you know, 40, 50 years, it's changed tremendously, right? Um, and you have, but, and, Places like, to be honest, like places like Echo Park and Silver Lake, those are where a lot of white people are moving to, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. And um, yeah, and a lot of folks are moving out of state. 
for sure. Yeah, yeah. But you're staying. I'm staying. And we're glad you're staying. Thank you. And uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So people can find your podcast wherever podcasts are sold. Yes. This Filipino American Life. Yes. This Filipino American Life. Uh, you can check us out any any places, any kind of medium where podcasts are. Uh, we have a website, thisfilipinoamericanlife.com. And so you can check us out if you're interested in us kind of being stupid and talking about um, stupid things like Filipino food. Like we had a, our last episode, we had a tournament about which is the best Filipino food, like a head old bracket, right? <laughs> um, but then we also talk about serious issues. Like, oh, wait, uh, who, won the, the who issue? won the bracket? Adobo. Adobo? Yeah. What's that? Adobo is a um, vinegar marinated um, meat dish. Right. Uh, it's usually traditionally it's kind of vinegar and soy sauce uh, and then you, you kind of marinate and you broil uh, or sorry, braise like either chicken or pork or something, sometimes beef. Um, but it's kind of, quote unquote, the national dish of the Philippines. Not officially, but it's a it's a very popular dish. How do you spell it? A-D-O-B-O, adobo. So adobo. Okay. So it's actually a Spanish term. Mm hmm. But it was, it's actually indigenous to the Philippines. So when the Spanish came, um, they called it uh, adobo because okay. adobar means to marinate. Oh. Right. And so. Where, um, where's, where's some good places in LA to get it? Around the corner. No. LA Rose Cafe is probably one of the best Filipino restaurants here in LA. Is it really? Yes. I've never been. You haven't been? I've lived here 22 years. <laughs> the only time I've even seen it on social media. Porn star Brie Olsen used to go there all the time. <laughs> I don't know how I was following her, but I was, and she was there, and she adores it. Yeah, the guy Lem, he's 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 operated since the beginning, since the early. So I should 80s. go over there and I say, I want some adobo. What but, I mean, the thing is, adobo is like the the most basic Filipino food. Yeah, I got to start somewhere. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of good stuff too. Okay, but Other stuff, do, good stuff. what? So then, what do I order for my sides? Adobo, uh, you, you should get a noodle dish. Okay. I think they do a good pancet palabok there, which is a, 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 a noodle dish, kind of a seafood-based uh, noodle dish. Um, and What's what's the seafood that'll be in there? Shrimp. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. And so then, shrimp noodles, because I, I, I can never say what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just say, yeah, just say pancet, if you can say that. Pancet. Yeah, that's uh, noodles. Pansek. Yeah. Panset. Panset. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they got a good, um, what's it called? I think lech lechon belly roll, which is basically a rolled up pork belly. Okay. Right? It's phenomenal. Um, they have good empanadas there, you know? Okay. Yeah. So, you you know, we, Philippines was uh, colonized by Spain. So yeah. there's a lot of uh, Spanish influence there. So the empanadas there are actually pretty good. So this is good for me, which is great. Thank yes. you. Our friends in Northridge, where should they go for all this? Uh, I don't know. There's not good. It's not that good in Northridge? <laughs> I would say there's only... Uh, to me, there's really one good Filipino restaurant in the valley. In the whole valley? The whole valley. Okay, what is it? Uh, 1.8 million people, only one good Filipino restaurant, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's called Goto at Silog. Okay. Uh, it's in Panorama City. I love Panorama. I was there yesterday. Across from the Panorama City Mall. I was there yesterday. Actually, I'm sorry. Two, I was at that Walmart. There's two good Filipino restaurants. Oh, okay. There's one there called Goto at Silog, which is kind of the south side of Roscoe. Wow. And then um, Bamboo Bistro, which is in the Plaza del Valle, right? That kind of... Uh, outdoor plaza uh they have a all you can eat filipino buffet phenomenal you are phenomenal <laughs> thank you thank you so much for coming over here oh he's pointing at the gift that he gave me yes yes you yes i want you to try this so uh cafe 86 is a filipino bakery slash coffee shop and um it's in northridge uh-huh um it started out in Chino Hills, but the only kind of location in the city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles, is in Northridge. Okay. So I wanted to give a little bit of Northridge, a little bit of okay, Filipino hold on. love We're to keep you. Keep the tape rolling. I'm gonna take a bite. Thank you. So those are 
ube uh, Oreo truffles. So ube is a purple yam, which is uh, kind of indigenous to the Philippines, endemic there. And it's actually gained popularity here in the States. And First they mix. Of all, the smell is great. <laughs> Very chocolatey smell. Yeah. It's soft. It looks like a big chocolate ball. Yeah. Cakey. It's very cakey. This is great. And they mixed in Oreos. So it's a, it's kind of a fusion Filipino. I am a chocolate aficionado. This is one of the best things I've ever eaten. Nice. This is so good. What do you call this again? Uh, those are just called ube truffles. Ube truffles. Yeah. Mm, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> and there's sugar sprinkled. Like there's not enough sugar. So they sprinkle it with extra sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, 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 yes. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for no, coming. Thank you for having me. We everybody tune in to uh, this Filipino uh, American life. Filipino. My mouth is so full. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll see you in Northridge, the mall. Yes. Thank you. Okay. How great was Joe? You know who we'd ride the bus with from the three two three to the eight one eight? Our Patreons. When you stoke us, you're saying, Tony, Jordan, it's getting near summer. Here's some cash for some new Speedos. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Rollman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Grinke, Ben Welsh, Jen Adams, Trevor Wilson, Bree Wild, Dougie Gyro, Christina Up North, Robin Carey, Adam Shorn, Ben from Down Under, Chris from the ATX, and Gregor. To be a Patreon, go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give it all up. Also, shout out to our Angelinos. To be an Angelino, all you got to do is PayPal or Venmo, 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website or Medium blog forever. Just send your hard-earned cash to busblog at gmail.com. Want to be like Joe and be on the show? Just email us at busblog at gmail.com. Would you like to support us, but the full-time gig you've had your eyes on just hasn't come true yet? You can still help. Post your favorite episode on your Facebook. Oh my God, post two. Tweet something nice about us. In fact, anytime you see me tweet about an episode, retweet it. And for God's sake, tell your friends. Tell them how Here in LA is spelled, and it's on Apple Podcasts and Google and even Spotify. Here in LA is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and the man who's produced 93 of these bad boys, Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Songs by Orgon and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to Cindy for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, and teachers and professors everywhere who dropped the science like Newton dropped that apple. Merci beaucoup, mi amigos. Go, go, go.